Hey, it's Will. I've got a very special video documentary for you today. It is probably the first and last video documentary I'm going to do, but it's on the evolution of the Rack AFX software and how it's related to the Aspic product. I have a new book coming out, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions and probably a lot of confusion as well as to how they're related or if they're related or, or what. And I wanted to do a video which explicitly shows how they were developed and how they are have been separated from each other. This is what Rack AFX looked like in 2004. It was called DSP Kit, and I was doing some consulting work for a company developing al audio algorithms. I needed to develop them really quickly. I've got a little piece of tape over the name of the WAV file, so you can't tell who that was. But in the long run, what happened was I was trying to use VST2 plugins as development platforms for making algorithms. So I would have a blank VST2 plugin. I would write some parameters into it, put the algorithm in. I didn't care about a GUI because I just I just needed to test the algorithm. So the little the generic sliders were fine, and I would do that, create the the plugin, test it, copy that file off, and then make a brand new version, create a whole new Visual Studio project, create another plugin, and each algorithm was kind of packaged inside of its own plugin, which was inside of its own Visual Studio project as well. It was really cumbersome and it was not the right way to work because the VST2 format or the API is a plugin uh, format. It is not designed for you know designing audio algorithms in a rapid manner. It's it's a plugin format. So what I did was I came up with this. You had a, a ping file here and some coefficients over here that were connected to the file. There were two rows of five, which made 10 sliders that you could write an algorithm for a little chunk of code that would convert slider movements into, into filter coefficients. Those would get transferred into the, uh, in, in the, to the algorithm and you could listen to it in real time while you were doing all that stuff. So it was all real time. You had an analyzer here that you could look at. It worked okay for small projects, but as I, as I was doing more advanced algorithms, it, was, it wasn't enough. So, by 2005, it had turned into this. Now there are four rows of 10 sliders. There's 40 sliders on the main panel here. There were uh, four sets of radio buttons back behind here, and an analyzer that had impulse and frequency response measurement capabilities. So it was actually uh, you know, pretty interesting at this point. I started teaching at the University of Miami in 2009, so by 2011, I had spun off a, a variation of DSP kit, which I called Socket. And uh, the analyzer looked like this. It had a, a digital scope built into it. You could load impulse response files into it. There were still four rows of 10 sliders and some miscellaneous controls over here. Now, by this time, my students had requested two things, neither of which I thought was ridiculous. One was they wanted to be able to export these algorithms as VST2 plugins. And then later on, after I put that into place, they wanted a GUI that was um, that they could design themselves, like a drag and drop GUI designer. The original VST exporting just used the generic sliders in VST. And I was really just cutting and pasting processing code. It wasn't like I was wrapping an object, I was just m shuffling code around to make a plugin. By the time 2013 rolled around, I had the GUI designer in place. You can see a very crude GUI here. My synth book had just come out, so it now worked with synthesizer plugins still four rows of, of sliders here and radio buttons. You can now see make AU and make VST. When I added the GUI into it, I could no longer just cut and paste simple code to, to spin off projects. And it was at this point I began uh, really working hard to wrap this old code from 2004 into AU and VST products. And um, this is where I probably should have stopped and not done that anymore. But I had two books that were out. I really couldn't help it. And uh, it wasn't like I could just delete everything and start all over at this point. So it had gotten here. I had violated my own rule at this point. I was now using a tool that was originally made for generating algorithms very quickly and testing them and turning that into a plug-in API. And that was not the right way to really do it in hindsight. In 2015, uh, I added a huge modification to the guts for thread safety issues in, uh, in the exported projects. 2016 added a new front end with a, with a bunch of knobs and buttons to replace all the ugly sliders. 
And then there was a three-year period of silence between now when Rack AFX7 has just been released. In 2016, I met with my publisher about doing a second edition of the FX book. It was absolutely clear that this could not be a book about Rack AFX. It had to be about AU, AX, and VST. And I decided to make my own framework that I could use to demonstrate those. I wasn't really interested in, in creating a whole new platform to sort of you know, give away and make or whatever. It was really more of a demonstration thing, but I r started work in earnest on AU, and then I finished all that plus the book manuscript uh, at the summer of 2018. The general way that I work, just to let you know, is uh, I'm on a kind of a contract where the summer months I have completely free to myself to do whatever I want. And during those months is when I really do the heavy work in programming. During the school year is when I work on books and papers. I'm, I'm lecturing, I'm teaching, the notes are coming in. It's, a really, it's really easy to work on books and papers at the same time that you're lecturing about the same you know, sort of stuff or researching it with your students or whatever. So um, I can do updates and do maintenance during the school year, but I really can't do hardcore development until uh, cr uh, Christmas break and summer break. So working on ASPIC really allowed me to concentrate on just the APIs, and it allowed me to go back and look at Rack AFX later and concentrate on making it a design and development tool. And we'll get into that in, into some videos in the future. Changes in one won't result in changes in the other. Now I have one more slide that I'm gonna show you here, and for anybody that works in software engineering or, or, or in any way with computer code or shipping software, this, is, this, video, this one slide is gonna say everything. You can sh stop the video after this slide if you want to. This is the Rack AFX 6 installer. It's over half a gigabyte in size. This is the Rack AFX 7 installer. It's 34 megabytes uh, zipped up as well as the other one. It's 5.7% of the size. Now, to put this into context with the ASPIC installer, the entire ASPIC SDK and that's five sample projects, template projects, um, two standalone Windows and Mac applications to generate blank projects and populate them, along with all the documentation, that's 37 megabytes. So if you work in software and you see this amount of material being shed out of a product to turn it into this, and you see that this little piece right here represents basically all the stuff that was shed out here, then you get a really good idea of what I did here. Basically, I have two lean, mean, and clean products. One of them does audio algorithm development, the other one does audio plug-in framework, and they don't talk to each other or deal with each other. They don't even like each other. Well, maybe they do like each other, I don't know. The development period of here is what I want to talk about specifically with what's called ASPIC. In the beginning, it was called the plug-in kernel. And I started out in round one with the plug-in kernel inside of an audio unit plug-in. I chose audio unit because it's the most restrictive. It has the Cocoa GUI that has to be done as a separate uh, product and compiled separately and then embedded inside of the audio unit. And the plug-in kernel was two pieces, a core and a GUI. Each part had their own separate functionality, one for audio signal processing and one for nothing but GUI. This blue background around here kind of represents either a moat or a wall, depending on what you want to call it, that divides the two. They can't talk to each other. They, they don't even know e that each other exists, and they don't require each other to exist in order to do their job. Once I got that running in audio unit, I took the kernel and just transplanted all the files directly inside of a blank AAX plugin that I had. And I did it all over again. I figured out what I needed to do to make the core and the GUI work with AAX. Then I took that and put that into VST3. This was all done during uh, a Christmas vacation. And so it was just sort of a proof of concept to see if this idea would work. And it did actually work. And I, I, by the end of this process, I had a good idea of what needed to be done which I started off on the, during the next summer. In this case, what I did was I took the original plugin kernel and I put it back into another AU plugin, and the purple here represents the fact that it is now a different product. Uh, I had made a bunch of changes before, and I rolled those all back into AU, and then into AAX, and then into VST3. By this point, the plugin kernel was about 99% done. 
it was still completely isolated with the moat here dividing the two halves. And the only things that were really left to do here were really minor things involving name strings and VST magic numbers and stuff like that. So it was in good shape for me to uh, sort of go on hold and come back the next summer. At this point, this is the beginning of the summer of 2018, the book manuscript was um, you know, 80% complete. It was kind of into its final stages. And I took ASPIC, which I, I had renamed it from plugin kernel to ASPIC, audio specific plugin kernel. And my goal here was to take this completed product, which I now talked about in the book, and figure out a way to incorporate that backwards into Rack AFX. Remember, ASPIC was developed completely independently. So this is gonna be a good test. If it was easy to put this in Rack AFX, I did a good job. If this was horrible to put in Rack AFX, maybe I didn't. The first thing I tried to do was to be very sneaky, which was to make a new plugin format called RAFX2, but really have it just be the ASPIC core. I mean, I worked on all this stuff, and it could render its own GUI, so why not? The answer is it didn't work. And the reason that it didn't work turned out to be a blessing. It didn't work because ASPIC is not complete enough to be a plugin API. It is not a plugin API. It is a core chunk of two items, each of which does a specialized operation on its own stuff. In fact, if you want to, you can just use the core and ignore the GUI part of ASPIC. Or if you like the GUI, you can throw the core away and only use the GUI part. That's how isolated the two of them are. The fact that it wouldn't make an API turned out to be, like I said, a really good thing. And what I did was I created a new API called RAFX2. I did not want to replicate all the work I had already done here. So I made RAFX2, or what I call RAFX2, basically a thin wrapper that goes around ASPIC. RAFX2 has all the stuff in it that you need to be an API. And what I mean by that is stuff very specific that a DAW and, and the plugin would need to know. ASPIC doesn't need to, need to know a lot of stuff uh, that's specific to just the DAW and the, and the plugin. So that's how they're sort of separated out. So if you create a project in Rack AFX7 now, like the Golden Flanger product that I have right here, and you hit the button to do the export, then what I do is I just extract out the ASPIC core, and I do that very simply by copying files. They are untouched. I literally pick up a directory of files, copy them into another directory, and that's it. No cutting and pasting, no changing of names, no Visual Studio projects to set up, none of that. It's just all the core aspect code that has now been uh, exported. The user can then take that, run CMake on it, and spin off their own AX, AU, and VST3 plugins however they like. At this point, RackFX has been lost in the background. It is far, far in the distance after this has happened. Now, this is looking at the final slide. Before I do this, I want to go over and hop over into Windows and show you something. This is, um, sorry, this is what the directory structure looks like for a RackAFX6 plugin. This is a flat directory structure. This is all the .h and cpp files, the Visual Studio Project files, the rackafx.prj file, which is right there. It's a flat directory structure. When rackafx first started out called dspkit, there were about eight files in here and that was it. It grew into a much larger flat directory. In rackafx7, when you create a project, this is what it now looks like. Here is the rackafx project file. And in the plugin kernel folder is the entire ASPIC plugin core. So when you do an export, all I'm doing is just grabbing that folder, copying that folder, and then that's it. It's great on my side. So one thing that I want to put up here is as Rack AFX is now at this point. ASPIC is here. Rack AFX is a rapid audio algorithm development tool, which I'm calling RAD. And ASPIC is a commercial audio plugin framework. There's a massive moat between the two of them. They don't talk to each other. They're not related other than Rack AFX can make ASPIC plugins. ASPIC can't make Rack AFX plugins or do anything like that. So I hope this video kind of explains where those products came from and how they were developed and how they are 
related and especially how they are separated. I will see you guys in the next video.